please welcome to the South by Southwest stage, Deborah Sengupta Stiff, Arash Darudi, Matthew Logan, Vasquez, and Cam Franklin. Hey, y'all. Thank you for coming to hang with us. I understand that it is 4 o'clock, and there are parties you could be at. And thank you so much for choosing to be here with us as instead. Um, I am really happy to be presenting this panel here today because uh, last year um, I, I cover a lot of music festivals from the Austin American Statesman and Austin 360. And last year going into ACL Fest, we really thought one of the big storylines was going to be politics. And so we were paying attention to where are musicians talking about politics. And what we noticed was that a lot of musicians were talking about mental health instead and how to how to overcome and get through things. And I feel like the last couple of years have just been so difficult for so many people that I'm really happy to present this panel of um, stories about overcoming adversity. So to kick things off, we were going to, well, first of all, let me introduce all of these amazing panelists, okay? So this is Arash Darudi. He is the general counsel and executive executive vice president at Fender, which is super exciting. This is the amazing singer, Cam Franklin. You probably know her from The Suffers, but she also has some solo music coming out, including the new single, A Bitch Didn't Listen, about taking too many edibles. And we have Matthew Logan Vasquez, and he also has a new single out called Untouchable, and it's a murder ballad. So... I, we're going to go down the line, and everybody has a really great story that kind of illustrates uh, the, this concept of true grit and overcoming adversity. And so we're going to have, I'm going to have each of them tell their story. We're going to mix it up a little, and then we're going to have some time for questions at the end. And so you can do the South by Southwest thing to do the questions, I believe. So we're going to start with Arash. Um, tell me about your story. It's, it's pretty amazing. It c crosses continents. Yeah, no, such a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Deb. Uh, it, it really, it does. It's a, it's a story of uh, being a victim of circumstance, if you will, and um, in the end, finding the light at the end of the tunnel. I was actually born in Texas. Both of my parents were students. Uh, they were from Iran, so I am Persian. And while they were students, they had me, hence I was born in Houston, Texas. Yay, Texas, I know. Uh, but then a revolution happens in 1979 in Iran, and you had two young students who were my parents stuck in a totally unknown country to them, and they had to make a decision. Do we stay in the United States or do we go back to Iran? They really didn't have a choice. They had to stay in the U.S., but they, they were on student visas. They couldn't work, so they couldn't support me. I was a six-month-old, and as, as you very well know, that takes, that takes a job, and it takes money to raise a child. My grandparents, who happened to be in the United States at the time on a tourist visa, made a suggestion to my parents. Why don't you let us take him, being me, to Iran for a period of six months? Because I was a U.S.-born citizen, U.S. passport. I could go back and forth as I please, but had my parents gone back, they couldn't have left. Why don't you let us take him to Iran while you guys get your visa situation in order and then summon him back and we'll bring him back to the United States? They really didn't have much of a choice, so they agreed. When I was six months old, I went to Iran with my grandparents. After getting to Iran a couple months later, all-out war breaks out between Iran and Iraq. My passport was taken away. I actually ended up not seeing my parents for seven years. I was stuck in Iran. It wasn't just the fact that I was away from my parents that was, that was the difficult part. That obviously was a major uh, element in my life at the time. But there was a war going on. You know, we have this incredible luxury in this incredible country to never really have to deal with a war on your own soil. So there was one story in particular where I woke up probably around 2, 3 a.m. in the morning, and it sounded like the explosion of a thousand fireworks go outside, three houses down, completely eviscerated. And there was a kid that I used to play with who lived in that house. So as a six-year-old, you know, that really does shape your perspective on, on the world. You start to sort of realize... It doesn't really get worse than that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you start to quickly realize that the world is not all candy canes and lemon drops as we, as we are told as, as kids. 
But that was just leg one of the journey. Leg two was, well, we need to find a way back to the United States. Now, you got to understand, as a six-year-old in Iran, all the movies come from the United States, all the music comes from the United States, and on top of it, add to the fact that they tell you your parents are in the United States. The United States was this Elysian Fields that I just, <laughs> in my mind, had to find my way back to. And I'll insert this just because of the fact that I, I work for one of the most iconic, uh, if not the most iconic guitar brand in the world. Yeah. I also loved Jimi Hendrix, and I loved Led Zeppelin, and I just loved all of the music that was created on these incredible instruments, not knowing that in the future I might actually end up there. We went on a journey, 19 different countries we went to, trying to find our way back to the United States. We would go camp out for weeks, waiting for the U.S. consulate, the U.S. embassy in various countries from India, Pakistan, Germany, Italy, to call our name, and we would go there, and they would ask, where are you coming from? We would say, from Iran, denied, go all the way back to Iran. We did this 19 times over the course of a year and a half until we finally got a visa from Turkey, reinstated my passport, and I came back to the United States. But the fun just starts when you come to the United States. My parents by that time had moved to Maryland, a very rural part of Maryland at the time, and it was difficult. For a person from my background, English became a third language, just as a, a matter of circumstance. And uh, for, for somebody from Iran, wasn't quite accepted in that community. I vividly remember growing up, I would be spit on. I would be told to go back to my country. And I couldn't figure out, well, where is my country? If I'm born in the United States and I belong here, why am I being told not to be in this country? I work through it. I worked through it, worked through it. My mother, who's very, very uh, uh, industrious, she told me, okay, the secret is we got to get you into private school, get you out of public school. It'll resolve all the problems. So I applied. I applied to a, a, a very prestigious pri private school in the D.C. metropolitan area. And my mother is persistent. You will not find a more persistent person than, than my mother. She keeps calling and calling and calling the admissions office until finally the admissions office says, ma'am, why don't you just come in, let's have a discussion. She hangs up the phone, turns to me, I'm like nine, 10 years old. She says, let's go, We're, this is it, you probably got in, they wanna tell you in person. Okay, I got dressed, we went there. So just to paint the, uh, the visuals for you, we walk in, we sit down, and it was walnut wooded walls with fox hunting pictures on the wall. I don't know who goes fox hunting in Maryland, but <laughs> apparently it is a thing. And the headmaster came in. And the headmaster came in and basically went on this 20-minute diatribe regarding the history of the school, its lineage, its tutelage, a bunch of different edges, and finally turns to my mother and says, ma'am, your son is obviously intelligent. He would probably do fine here. However, his communication skills, his accent is entirely too difficult to understand. We can't let him come here. Now, at that moment in time, my mother, being an immigrant in this country, there's only so much that you can do or say. You, you kind of feel like you're the guest of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the owner of the house, and there's only so much that you can really say. She didn't say anything. She stood up. She shook the headmaster's hand and said, thank you. And she walked out. We went in the car. She closed the door. And she started uncontrollably crying. Now, I didn't cry because I didn't want to make her upset. I waited until I got home. I'll take you to leg two of the journey. Trust me, this is going to get somewhere. Leg two of the journey, I ended up graduating from law school. I came out. Dream was to work for this firm that is based in Washington, D.C. area. And, and for me, it was like, this is it. I have to work in this firm. A friend of mine said, look, there is this uh, recruiting event. Get yourself there. There's going to be a bunch of managing partners there, and you'll maybe run into somebody. Fantastic. So I went down to the Mayflower Hotel in D.C., and it was a recruiting session, and there was open bars all over the place, and about 70, 80 people, potential recruits, were there. And I was standing at the bar when I noticed one of the managing partners walk towards the bar. And I also noticed that he had been drinking. So I'm thinking, this is a great opportunity. I'm going to go in for the kill. <laughs> I go up to him, and we start a conversation. About five minutes in the conversation, he turns to me and says, so what are you doing here? I said, well, 
This is an incredible firm. I love your international presence. International is my forte. It would be an honor. I, I would love to learn more and see how I can join the firm. He stops and he looks at me and he says, have you looked around the room? And I said, yes. You don't really fit the pedigree to be here, do you? And I said, what pedigree is that? He said, just look around the room. And he walked off. I'll take you to the last leg of the journey. I came to Fender as an associate general counsel. At the time that I came to Fender, it was a completely different world. Our current CEO was not with the organization yet. Ownership was a completely different ownership. And an opportunity came up for uh, me to apply for the general counsel role. So. I decided not to throw my name in the hat. I said, I'm not gonna do that. Everybody around me said, no, 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 you have to do this. You, you basically run this, this operations on a global scale, just throw your name in the hat. I said, they're not gonna give me this position. This is Fender, this is one of the most iconic American brands in the history of not only music history, but in, in American history, it's just not gonna happen. They're like, well, if you don't throw your name in the hat, we're gonna throw your name in the hat, fine, throw the name in the hat. And I distinctly remember interviewing with one of the owners of the organization that's no longer there. And during the interview, he refused to shake my hand. And then after I sat down, about 10, 15 minutes into it, I was abruptly cut short and I was told that I don't, you don't really fit the look or the type of a general counsel. Now, at that moment in time, something within me said, don't react emotionally, control. What this person is saying is coming from a place of ignorance, not hatred. They're cousins, but they're a little different. How do you overcome ignorance? You overcome ignorance through education. And I channeled my mother the way that she actually dealt with that headmaster. She simply stood up and shook his hand. I simply stood up and I attempted to shake his hand. He didn't shake my hand. And I said, thank you for the opportunity. I went up into my office and I closed the door. And I said, the next time that I walk down into that office, I'm going to become the general counsel of this company. The next time that I went down into that office, I became the general counsel of this company. Bang. Thank you. I not only became the general counsel of the company, I became the youngest to be promoted in their 76 year history from vice president to senior vice president to executive vice president. And they even called me up one day and said, we want you to be the president of our foundation. We want you to run that. I was the first one in Fender's history to hire the first female attorney, the first female attorney in 76 years, the first African-American attorney, Asian-American attorney, Native American attorney, LGBTQ, veteran, disabled, completely changed the demographics there. And of the 600 lawyers that I work with around the world, we changed that demographic as well. I had to be more representative of the people that we sell products to. What I learned, Debbie, throughout this process and, and why I welcome the opportunity to speak on this, on this stage is, I learned a very important lesson. Your perceived weaknesses can many times be your greatest strengths. For the longest time, I went by the name Alex. I went by the name Ross. I don't even know where that came from. I went by a lot of different names because I thought that I had to be a white male in order to succeed in my profession. And I consistently failed, and I swam in the sea of mediocrity for years and years and years until I said, you know what, no more. I'm gonna be who I am. My name is Arash Darudi. I come from a 2,500 year old culture. There's been a lot of learnings that have been passed down to me generation after generation. I'm gonna try to be me. Let's, let's try this guy for a change. That's when I untapped into some immense potential that I never knew was possible, but it was, all, it was always there. Your perceived weaknesses can be your greatest strengths. I think that that is a great life lesson that I know that I have struggled with uh, during my life. And I think it's great to hear how you've overcome. Cam, also not a white man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> wait. <laughs> I know that this sort of has fed into some of your struggles. Can you tell, talk a little bit about your experience? Uh, yeah, I'll give the early section first. So uh, I've been doing music in public since I was five years old. I started off singing in the church and sang all throughout high school and 
at the very end, I had this vision that I was going to join No Doubt. I didn't really understand <laughs> how bands worked <laughs> exactly. I was like, I'm going to join No Doubt. I'm going to be the queen of ska, and <laughs> life's going to be awesome. That would have uh, been amazing, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Look, um, but I my path went a little differently, and I started working as an intern uh, under this guy named Matt Sanzala in Houston. And... Um, it was at this radio station, and for the longest time, I, I just thought, like, one day I'm going to have a, a project, and Matt's going to help me get it on the radio, or he's going to help me do something, because I was working for free. But I knew how the industry worked. I knew we were in an industry of favors at the end of the day, as long as you showed up to learn and be ready to work, right? And I'm really appreciative of that time, because I got an introduction to how nice people could be before I got the other side. And so um, before I ever joined any bands, I would sit in with them a lot. I did backup singing and I did backup dancing and had this opportunity to go on tour with this group from London called The Very Best. And right before we played Pitchfork, I broke my ankle and I played Pitchfork in a wheelchair. Uh, and I bring this up because it was not just a casual ankle break. My ankle came out of both sides of my leg and I had to take six months of doing nothing for before I could start to walk again. And uh, I had to get a real job because touring was not an option for me at the time. And so I stayed at that real job for about six and a half years. And during my final year at that job, my band The Suffers started. And we got an opportunity to do Letterman during his last few weeks of existence. And so I quit my job and I've been on the road full-time since then, that was 2015. Um, initially coming out and coming from working at an investment bank and working in an international space and then living in an international city like Houston and then going into the touring world and going into the major festival touring world, I got to see really quickly how you get treated when you're considered the hot new indie act um, but I also got to see how you're treated when you ask just real questions. And so coming from Houston, I was raised under the influence of Beyonce and Barbara Jordan. And so asking about my fellow woman, asking about my fellow black person, my fellow brown person was just something that came naturally. And so we started playing a lot of major festivals and what I started noticing just coming from the analytics world, there would always be three major black acts. This is before 2020, so don't be looking at any of the lineups now, but this is like 2016, 2015, 2017. I would look at the lineups and I would see three black acts, sometimes four black acts at the festival, and we'd be billed similarly together. Um, and it would usually be The Suffers, Alabama Shakes, Gary Clark Jr., and Leon Bridges. We'd never be on the same day. Uh, there was no opportunity for us to build any type of relationship because we'd never be on the same day. And I'm talking like months. And I just started asking why that was a thing and why there'd only be four, sometimes only three, uh, where the black people were, where the brown people were, anyone that's not familiar with my band, The Suffers. Yes, I'm a black woman and I front the band, but my band is 80% Mexican. And when we would show up to festivals, people would automatically assume that I was asking about the blackness that was missing. They were the only Mexicans. They were the only brown people that we would see usually for days. And when I first started bringing it up, I was told that I was putting my career at risk. You know, you're, you're playing this and you're playing that. Here, I'll just, I'll just be clear. You're, you're playing as big as it can get. One weekend you're playing Newport Folk Festival. Next weekend you're doing NPR Tiny Desk. The next weekend, oh, you're going down to Hangout. Oh, you're coming down to ACL. You're doing this. But then I'd look around and it's still, that was just me asking about where the people were. When I actually started learning what Polestar was, anybody that doesn't know what Polestar is, it's a magazine that shows everybody's ticket counts and numbers and who's the hottest touring act at the time. You do a little simple math, you start realizing, huh, if we're only being booked this much, that means that we're the only ones making money in this field. That means that the equity is missing. 
not just the inclusion, not just the diversity, the equity, the chance for the next person that looks like me uh, to make money, to have an experience, to have a career isn't there. And so coming off of my side hustles as a writer and uh, just as an activist, any time that I'd get asked in interviews, what felt good, what felt bad, I'd bring it up. I'm in a national platform. Sorry, I'm going to bring it up. I'm having a beautiful time at the festival today, but it doesn't feel great to be the only black person I've seen in three days. You know, and I would ask. I don't know why it's so hard. And I'd hear different responses. Sometimes it would be, oh, well, there's already one Alabama Shakes. We don't need to see any more of that. There's already a Sharon Jones. We don't need to see any more of that. Why would we need to book that? Or it would go to, why are you bringing this up? Like, this is the worst timing. And I would ask for meetings. I'd ask for, you know, when can we talk about the lack of equity at your organization? Uh, there's just not, I, th I think that's a really inappropriate conversation. And what makes you think that you're the person that we should be starting these conversations with? And the last five years, I've gotten to see a very dramatic shift. When I really started bringing this up, writing about it, I wrote an article um, back in 2017, one for Forbes and one for Vice, who didn't seem to think that what I was talking about was that dumb, that didn't seem to think that what I was talking about was that irrelevant. Um, and it pissed a lot of people off because I kept asking that question. But then you come to 2020 and you see a lot of these organizations, these labels, these production and promotion companies putting up black squares, but no money, putting up black squares, but not responding to questions putting up black squares, but not actually putting equity into place, right? We're in the state of Texas right now where we have a governor that said, no more DEI in your hiring. That means that all of the accountability that we've been building, not just for black people, not just for brown people, not just for women, not just for non-binary trans people, all of that gets tossed out of the window because one dude who also made it very hard if you're disabled to make money the same way that he made his money says that we can't do it anymore. But again, where I come from, I was taught that if something is wrong and I have the voice, everybody doesn't have the voice or the confidence to speak up on behalf of others or to speak up on behalf of themselves. If I was given this gift to just be like, where is everybody else? Why are we not being paid in an equitable way? Especially when it comes to the women. You know, when do we start talking about it? When do we start changing you know, the way that we do stuff? And so some might say that I threw my career a little bit into a trash can when I started bringing this shit up, but I think that I gave myself and my career a whole new life and a whole new way to exist because it's no longer a scary topic for me. I'm not gonna stop being black. My vagina's going nowhere. So like I've had to, <laughs> like I've had to like come up with a new way to exist that isn't so horrible because what was being asked of me previously was take it. You should, you should be, be happy. so lucky. Yeah. You should be. Do you know how many bands would love to be in your position right now? I'm like, do I look like I give a fuck? Like, do I? I got here because of hard work and people that were rooting for me and the people that had you know, the gall to, to share what we, it was we were doing, not because of anybody else's anything, right? But to tell me that everything that I've done goes away because I had the nerve to ask for equity, to tell me that I'm now being punished or back blacklisted because I had the nerve to ask about equity, to me says that I need to keep doing this work. It says that I need to keep lighting people up and keep asking the questions so that the generation that comes after me, who's far more feisty than I am, will have a lot less to do. And I literally heard Cam bring these things up in an interview with ACL Radio this morning. So <laughs> it's Austin. Who else is going to bring this shit up? You know, like, you know, so sorry, no offense if you live here and you love it. But this is the city where I got a full beer can thrown on thrown at me in the middle of a soul performance. And no one did anything until I stopped myself. I stopped myself. I and, audibly yeah. gasped when she told me. At Blues story. on the Green, one yeah. of the most family friendly shows in the city. And even after that, it was do you have to keep bringing it up? Yes, assault becomes non existent if you don't acknowledge that it happened. 
And even between that, it was a few years before they had another black female headliner, Jackie Vincent. Yes. And it's exhausting. And I would way rather be talking about more fun stuff. But people keep fucking with my money. And that's why I have to keep bringing this up. I want to make it easier for the next generation. I want to make it easier for me to do the thing I love, but not have to deal with so much hardship when it's unnecessary. But I also think that I am living a great life because of the women that came before me. If I were touring during the Mavis Staples Aretha in their prime eras, there were no hotels that I could sleep on. I'd have to go to a funeral home, a black funeral home at that. And that's if it wasn't crowded already. And you're talking about some of the legends not being allowed to stay in hotels. It's not lost on me. That's my grandmother's generation and she's very much so still alive. And so to be able to sit here, um, like the four of us right now, this is a form of modern protest right now. The fact that we're getting to talk about our individual stories and just to be here to have you as a moderator, none of that is, is lost on me. But if you don't mention the history, it gets lost. If you don't bring it up, nothing changes. People think everything's happy-go-lucky, and I have to bring it up all the time. I love Austin. God, it's like my cousin that I get into it with all the time, but we have a good time when we finally relax. Um, <laughs> I want to be able to enjoy myself here without the nonsense, but the nonsense is still going on. So here we are. Yeah, here we are. Here we are. And we are lucky to have you speaking up for the people. Thank you for yeah. having yeah, me. Camp. Matthew, your story is a little bit different because you kind of thought you had an easy ride and then you didn't. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Oh, man. Following y'all stories is just a terrible idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up in... Uh, hi, I'm Matthew Vasquez. What's up? Um, yes, I am an alcoholic. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, seriously, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I grew up here as kind of a misfit kid, child of, uh, you know, bankruptcy that led to a divorce. I moved to California because I dropped too much LSD and landed in California. <laughs> uh, that was Austin in the 90s for me, at least. <laughs> and uh, it was a wonderful time and a great age to do it uh, for me. I got to kind of restart my um, my teenage misfit years, and I kind of had a more wholesome high school experience, ironically, moving to the West Coast. Um, but yeah, I have always loved rock and roll music. I have always loved playing in bands, and uh, it's just been that spiritual road for me. And uh, when I was 19 years old... Uh, like from busking uh, in a tunnel <laughs> by the beach, this guy uh, led to a friendship that ended up getting me a bunch of these like showcase type things. This is in the early 2000s, so pre Spotify, Napster. Record era. labels still have money. Yeah, record labels had a ton of money, and they signed everybody all at the same time to these things called development deals. John Kuntz remembers those. <laughs> hey, John. Good to see you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we ended up, uh, I, I signed to uh, what was then DreamWorks and one of these uh, development deals and had a, had a publishing deal with BMG lined up that was $250,000 and the signing bonus that it would have had. Mind you, I'd become a, I was a 20-year-old and then a 21-year-old at that time with the promise of half a million dollars and living in the uh, Oakwoods, uh, which was this weird child actor uh, puppy mill, also <laughs> neighbors with uh, Scott Weiland for a minute there. Um, weird place, uh, but lived there. It was really fun and crazy, and I was way out of my depth. I wasn't ready for any of that stuff, and I met a lot of amazing songwriters, and I learned a lot of incredible things um just just how to write a song and i got to be in all these studios and granted looking back it's like that's such an incredible learning experience um and i cherish those memories but also 
as a 21 year old uh you know with the with like a week away from uh receiving half a million dollars and being like wow this is really happening and then i go out to coffee and i get told it's not happening and three of the guys in your band uh you know you have to tell them and they're basically like great i'm homeless or i have to move back to australia and um having that weight be on you was crushing and uh you know, as I said before, my family had gone through kind of a uh, had gone through a bankruptcy. So we were, you know, we lived in Southern California in pretty affluent area, Dana Point. But we lived like five of us in a two bedroom apartment. My parents slept in the kitchen, and everything had kind of like discombobulated since I'd left for Los Angeles to go uh, chase my my dream of playing music professionally. And so when I came back, I wound up being the one to sleep in the kitchen. And uh, as I was sleeping in the kitchen, just depressed and rudderless, uh, I woke up and there was a rat sitting on my stomach just staring at me. <laughs> I have no idea how long this rat was there, but he was just looking at me. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta do something, man. And I, I had a nervous breakdown. Uh, I went, I joined a cult for a minute. I, got, <laughs> I did. He was in California. Yeah. No, name. I was in, no. this one was in Kansas City. So oh, I went to okay. Kansas City for a month where they did the nonstop praying thing. It was really quite something. <laughs> and um, and I, I tried to do that again, um, like to, to seek religion. But uh, and it worked for a little while. But ultimately, the thing that happened was, was my friends in the music scene in San Diego uh they they found me and reached back to me from from just being in a the community of a music scene you know like going to shows all the time and playing shows all the time and those friends uh came around me or like hey man let's start a band and they had also gone through the same thing they were on american and rick rubin executive produced their record and um and then the same thing happened where they're like they were just completely devastated and rudderless for a couple of years there and we decided to start our band Delta Spirit and kind of our credo was we just weren't going to listen to anybody and we're just going to make the music that we felt like we wanted to make which honestly was just like we really wanted to be BRMC and the Walkman at the same time when we started our band <laughs> and um but we did it. We started this band, and um, you know, we uh, we found we were really lucky to find a great team and the core kids that took us took us on tour and stuff. But but it was really that community um, and those guys in that moment, and they really they really did save my life. I mean, I don't I like yeah, I'm grateful for them, and but it's also like us together. It was about just you know we got the big no from the label and sometimes you just go kick rocks and go home and go i guess i'll be a lawyer sorry <laughs> no <laughs> no offense Burn. taken at you <laughs> but uh but no no uh you know if you really really love this uh, or really love anything uh you have to pursue it and just go for it and um you know, maybe something that you love more will present itself, and uh, you know, happiness is a perspective, and I'm, I'm pretty happy. Thanks. So I think a common. Oh yeah, give him, give him some applause, guys. I, like that. I, I really like applause. <laughs> I think a common thread in all of your stories is defying the gatekeepers. Um, so how do you? Talk about how you found the confidence in yourself, because that's a pretty scary thing to do. I mean, especially, you know, Cam, you're talking about people are like, look, we booked you on this festival. Why are you complaining? How do you find the confidence in yourself? And is there like a pep talk you give yourself or? The library is probably my biggest tool. Um, Every time I, I speak up for anybody, I just, again, I always think of who did it before me. I'm not the first, right? I am the next generation that is now entering a position to where I can be quiet and take it, 
or I can speak up and say, this doesn't feel good. This isn't right. This is off. Right. And yeah, my voice will shake. I, you know, I have to question myself constantly through the, the gatekeeping gaslighting that happens often, uh, back to back. And I have to ask myself, am I, Am I doing this out of something that is personal? Am I doing this because I'm trying to help or am I doing this for some ulterior reason? And again, if, it, if it's scaring me to speak up, usually it's because I have to, to do it. And in terms of the confidence, I think confidence is a perspective also, right? Like it can be 20 minutes you know, from now and I'll have a completely different feeling about, you know, the things I said, but I'm not going to question them. I'm not going to regret them because they need to be said. And in terms of like the long-term effects of it, I just trust the universe. I trust the work that I do and who I am as a human being. And I know that I work really hard to be a good human being and to show up for other people. And I wish I could bottle confidence, but I don't, I don't really have a true answer other than practicing it. Yeah. What about you, Arash, when you were in those situations where people were saying, look around the room, do you see anybody who looks like you here? How do you, how do you get to the point where you can be like, well, but there's me now and let's get more of us in here? I think it's really part of the the American story, right? Um, what's interesting is I learned this later on, going back to what you said, you know, when you when you read about history, um, Gangs of New York. If you ever see that movie, the Irish were not treated very well when they first came to the United States, and then later on, when the Italians came from Europe, came from Italy to the United States, they weren't actually treated that well either. I think it, it's just a part of the the American story, if you will. Uh, for me. It is, I think, Cam, you touch on this as well. It's about paving the path whereby other individuals that maybe perhaps are of my background or of unfamiliar backgrounds, perhaps it's a little bit easier for them when that time comes. The pioneers always get the arrow. Somebody has to go through, somebody has to pave the path. It's just, it is what it is. But uh, it's bigger than you. I think for me, it's it's bigger than me. For me, I'm not. I'm not... Uh, vanity is of no significance to me whatsoever. Sitting in this position with this incredible company, it's, it's a representation of the possibility that if you open up your lens and your aperture to people from different backgrounds, they may actually be quite helpful to you. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Matthew, you didn't talk about this today, but when we talked, you talked a little bit about how when you were at a low point, you took a job working with um, differently abled people. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. Well, that was uh, this is the only real job I ever got. It was, <laughs> the, it was super fun. <laughs> yeah, and it's a uh, you know that passion is carried on with the uh, um, Delta Spirits' last music video, uh, "Done Is Done," and uh, working with Michael Parks Ronda, whose family uh, has worked with uh, MTV for "How's Your News." Have you guys heard of "How's Your News" or remember that? Where uh, differently, differently abled folks would interview politicians and stuff, and it would be pretty, pretty radical. But um, yeah, I mean, that was a job that that really did, uh, really did boost some, uh, boost some self confidence in in a in a way. You know, there's this slogan over the door when you would go in. It's it's not what you uh, it's not what you can do, but it's what you do with what you got. And uh, I think that's a pretty universal mentality to have. You know. So I think all three of you have talked a little bit about trying to build a culture of belonging. And I think that that's something like after you get to that place, trying to hold the door open for the person who comes behind you, what are some of the steps that you feel are essential in that process? Um, I would say that always acknowledging that there's space for everybody. There's, there's literally in every field, every it may not be at the exact event that you're trying to get on or the exact festival, but in terms of the arts, whether you're a writer, you're a musician, singer, songwriter, whatever, if you're willing to do the work and commit to it, there's space and there's funding for you. But I think that we are all kind of put into this mindset that there's only just a little bit available for a little bit of us. And that's the big lie that exists within our industry. And it, it creates a, 
uh, an air of competition that doesn't need to be there when we should actually be striving for collaboration and uh, passing on of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I only hire underdogs. I, I only hire people who have chips on their shoulders. That, that's purposely done that way. And again, I, if you walk through my, my department, it is a, represent, a representation of the United Nations, as far as I'm concerned. We have all sorts of backgrounds there. But when you give the opportunity to people who have gone through difficulty in their lives, I want to know what the difficulty is, how you overcame it, and what you learned from it. Because unfortunately in this world, you only get stronger through challenges. You only get stronger through obstacles. I want those people. I will, and when they get their opportunity, hopefully they can do what I do, is open up the doors for other individuals. And when you stand back after a couple of years, you realize, oh wow. I made some significant changes, not only in the lives of these individuals, but a significant change in the lives of the people that surround them that never thought that they could actually get value from people from this background or with that unusual name with a whole bunch of vowels, successive vowels and such. Um, yeah. I love, I love the power of the underdog. I'm, I'm all 100% here for that. Um, you guys, uh, you've, you've talked a lot about... Uh, coming up with the confidence to overcome and, and breaking down these, uh, these barriers. Were there, was there ever a time where you just felt like, I, I can't do this. I'm ready to walk away and quit. And what did you do to get back to the place where you felt like you could keep fighting the good fight? <laughs> I feel like that weekly. Um, and I mean, that's just being real. And I think it's, I feel like if you really have a passion and it doesn't frustrate you to a point where you question your overall existence every now and then, I think something's off. But there's always something about this music thing specifically that not only draws me back in, but saves me, restores me, uh, whether there's an audience or not. There's something about making music with other people, the common, the just hearing the, combination of tones and voices and like the science of what all of that does. Um, I can't name how many breakdowns I've had. I can't name how many times I've felt defeated or questioned my existence uh, within just my own industry. Um, but it hasn't deterred me. It hasn't made me want to do this any less. Um, I just tell myself to have the moment, let the emotions out if they really need to come out then and just get back to it. And every time I get back to it, I, I feel so much better about making that decision. I feel so much better about taking the risk and being brave enough to keep going because a lot of people don't push through. A lot of people don't keep doing this and that's with everything. And I kind of think that that sort of goes back to what Arash was talking about, about learning how to accept your weaknesses as your strength, yeah. which I think is a great challenge for all of us. And another thing, you know, you were saying earlier is to get past, um, my therapist calls it a scarcity mentality, and to get to an abundance mentality. And uh, and do you have any... Uh, any advice for how to how to change that mindset? This is clearly something me and my therapist struggle with. <laughs> so, I do. Yeah, do it. Starting every day uh, like a fresh day, like uh, like st starting your day intentionally. I think is always uh, and like building that mentality. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the abundance mentality, or or just that you know that you have the power to decide how you reflect off other people and and uh, sometimes it starts with just a simple prayer or a meditation or a run or you know some yoga or just or just stare at your coffee for 10 minutes without crushing the cup <laughs> you know but um yeah you know that i think that that choice and intention at the first you know at the first moment of your day or like before you pick up you know your 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 apple brand god you know it's be good i think in terms of uh or just to add to what he's saying in terms of the intentionality of it all there's something to be said about starting your day off and just knowing like this is going to be a better day 
or if the day before was horrible, just looking at it as a reset for myself. I, I start every day knowing, all right, we're going to do it better than we did it yesterday. And that's something I picked up from my management team when we first got together a couple years ago. And it really is like that when you start putting it into practice and you, when you start thinking about the scarcity mindset, it goes back to there's room for all of us. And when you really start to question like, well, what am I getting? What am, I did go through that phase and I, I was there for a while. I just started writing it down. You're not supposed to count your blessings, but you can write down and start a gratitude list. And sometimes gratitude isn't necessarily in the form of accomplishments or accolades. Sometimes it's in the form of having a job that you love. Sometimes it's in having a community that will answer your phone call and give you advice and support you when you can't really support yourself. And that to me, that, that to me is its own form of wealth, but it's its own form of what is absolutely needed to progress in all of our, our days. You know, you need that support system. You need that belief in yourself, but you also have to have that little bit of incentive of knowing like there's something out there that is specifically for me. Like every single person in this room, no matter what you may do, there is something out there that you are going to get that only you can get because of how you do it and how you move through this life that absolutely nobody else could get. Right. And that that's the same for every single one of us. And it's because of how our paths are decided but when we're put in again into these mindsets of competition and there's only one this or there's only one that rather than man we could be taking all of our gifts and doing some real cool shit and like real cool music honestly like that's probably one of my favorite things about collaborating with Matt is that it did not make any sense like our, my, my former manager for years was trying to get us to meet and it was always like I got shit to do I don't know. and it was because I thought I knew everything but then when we finally got together, I was like, dang, this is like one of my favorite people I've ever met. And I think that's like a real representation of what happens when you step out of that box of thinking you know everything. Scarcity, I think, is associated with thinking you know everything. You think it's going to run out. Why? Why do you assume that? You think there's not an opportunity for you. Why? Because your anxiety or something in your mind and convinced you that, <laughs> that, you're, that you're not deserving. And nah. And I like what you're saying, too, about kind of intentionally building community, because I feel like the I feel like the pandemic kind of ruined me, <laughs> kind of ruined a lot of us. And I've only this year gotten to the point where I'm like actively being like, I need to make lunch dates with my girlfriends because that helps my mental health you know and so what about you Matt talk totally about, talk I mean, about it's like building community uh I have I have two kids now uh you know they get big and your whole life gets sucked into that and without like you know non-music related adult male friendships you know like playing tennis poorly with someone and just talking shit like helps a lot just to you know do that or go bowling oh man bowling <laughs> what a dumb, great thing bowling is. <laughs> Westgate Lanes is still open, and it's awesome. They have barbecue there. It's a little shout out to y'all, Westgate Lanes. But you know, you can. It's just those sense of community where it's just like you can text any number of friends, and they've just been sitting by the phone going like, you know, everybody's going and doing their stuff. But you know, it's to everybody gets excited to be like, oh, like we're all gonna hang out. That's a fun community thing, and it's. You know, we've been streaming so many darn shows the last you three years. Trust that some of your friends are just as overwhelmed, just as anxious, just as depressed, uh, just as shamed about not calling or texting as you may be. And it took a big practice, but last year that was a resolution for me was once a month I'm going to reach back out to one friend <laughs> instead of like maybe the dozens that it felt like I lost contact with during COVID. But overall it's been like a mental just gift reconnecting. Yeah, and I also think that <clears throat> to be to, to find happiness is obviously a pursuit that every human being um, sort of goes after. But I think you need a cause. You need something bigger than you. Something that that's that you're you're fighting towards that's just not for personal gain, but it's for the gain of a lot more people than you. You know, growing up as an Iranian in, in this country, I 
the most difficult thing that ever happened for every Iranian or Persian, whatever nomenclature you want to utilize, was the hostage crisis in the, in the 1980s. We've had to overcome that negative shadow that's hung over each and every single one of us. For me, it's incredible that in today's day and age, an Iranian is a person who's responsible for protecting the brand that basically is, is responsible for saving the, the history and the art of Buddy Holly, Jimi Hendrix, Muddy Waters, an Iranian is doing that. So it's, it's bigger than you. And when you think about it that way, and yes, there are times it gets very hard, very, very hard. But when you stand back and say, no, this is, this is bigger than me, I, th I think I need to just continue going forward. Just keep going. Just keep going. So we have about 10 minutes left. Let's see if any of you lovely people have questions for us. I think there's some magic that's supposed to make questions appear on the screen. Hello, hello. Perhaps there are no questions, <laughs> which is fine too. Uh, so uh, Matthew, um, <laughs> We covered a lot of ground. We did cover a lot of ground. So, you know, it's interesting because, like, you talking about wanting to, like, actively work on your friendships, I feel like that that's something that's kind of easier for women than men. Like, I feel like men are socially conditioned. I think so. To not bro around as much. Is that is that true? <laughs> Tell me. I don't know. I try to stay clear of, uh, you know, sex norms. But, uh, you know, like, I think... Uh, it's hard for anybody to reach out and, you know, I think, you know, we uh, we as people are always trying to be like, are you part of my, tri you know, we're all, we are all a bunch of monkeys, right? So you are like, oh, are you, are, are you safe? Are you my friend? Do you like me? Can I be myself? Can I feel cool around you? And, uh, you know, having the risk to invite people over to do stuff, it's it's tough. It's It's easier to just go with the flow, you know. I get anxious about making play dates for my kids sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? oh we got, do we have a question? Yes. Uh, can you use the microphone? Oh. Ooh la la. I like your hat. Thank Wait, you. I also had a question. My hat likes you. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, you, he can go first if he was. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. Wait. Mic's lowered. Okay. Um, I loved all of your guys' stories. It, you know, just... There's a lot to overcome, and it's like very clear that your endurance outweighs the problems that you guys faced. And one thing I was wondering about is how do you foresee future generations carrying it forward? Like, what do you foresee the responsibilities being? I think it starts with future generations believing in themselves and, uh, the fire that y'all all have within you. Like anytime you're questioning something that's wrong, ask. Like, why are we doing this like this? I, I work with a lot of people under the age of 25 through mentorship, through collaboration, and I'm so impressed by how rowdy they get. <laughs> but I also have to explain to the people that exist in the older generations that when you hear a young person taking the time to speak up about a topic, you're talking to someone that's been traumatized at school. Like, I'm 35, I'll be 36 in June. I'm one of the last generations that didn't have shooter drills in schools. We had tornado drills in schools. So when I'm listening to someone under the age of 25 that is taking the time out of their anxious ass day to complain about something, I'm listening. So if, if that's where you're existing now and you're just afraid or something to speak up about stuff, just keep putting it into practice, write it down, talk to people about it, find a loud homie to go and say it for you if that's easier. But <laughs> I would just say to keep doing what y'all are doing because it's impressing me every time I interact with y'all. The beauty of this country is for your generation, if there's something that you don't like, change it. But you have to put the effort into it to change it. It's not going to be easy, but it's very much worth it when you actually do make the change. Absolutely. Next. Thank you. Well, I want to start with an apology. I, I missed um, up until five minutes ago. On my way here, I got into a car accident, um, which is... That happens, you know, I'm okay, she's okay, the cars are what they are, they're drivable. But um, I have a disability and it's really interesting because 
when people saw that my plates were handicapped, some people were overly, um, you know, oh, it was her fault. And the girl and I still don't know whose fault it was. We were forced from four lanes into one by the police. You know, I was in front of her. She was like 17. But, um, and then other people got in to it and there were people actually fighting and I, I have pretty bad fibromyalgia and I ended up fainting. I just got into a panic attack about the level of chaos that was surrounding all this. What is your magic, like, what is your bubble that you put yourself in so that you can get through these moments? Um, I mean, I'm always stronger after. And I'm always strong for everybody else. But how in the moment do you guys have tricks? I smoke a lot of weed, personally. (laughs) I don't advise that, especially if you drive in. I'm allergic. Thank God. (laughs) Uh, But... (laughs) <laughs> to answer your question, again, it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of practice. I have to practice a lot of emotional intelligence just to deal with the dumb questions that I deal with on the daily, just be it racism, sexism, something dumb. Um, but I have no concept of what it's like to live as a disabled person. I, I don't. However, from the hardships that I do endure and that I do have to push through and when I am dealing with someone where all I can do is just kind of take it sometimes I just try to breathe and I try to just be as present as I can be but I also know how to escape mentally if I need to um, I don't know how to teach that, but I feel like you know what I mean when well, I say that. I know that. what you mean because yeah. I can teach it Yeah, but I I, I mean yeah, it was crazy. I, I just, I. Sorry that I, happened. But ever... No, I just took all of it in as opposed to deflecting it back to the people that had nothing to do with the situation. The girl was fine and I was fine, but then all these strangers like got involved and I let it, you know, affect me negatively. Um, that's what I really just, God, I know you guys have a trick. I can just. Yeah, tell. you're okay. You are okay. Just take a nice, long, wonderful breaths and know you're fine. You're okay. This is like the most. <laughs> this is an acoustically balanced, quiet, peaceful room. Just take some nice, slow yeah. breaths. And know that You're bad okay. days happen sometimes. It really sucks when they happen, but sometimes it happens. And the best thing that you know today is that that shit's not going to happen again. <laughs> so <laughs> You're also You're also going through your disability, again, throughout your life. You're much stronger than you actually think you are significantly stronger than you think you are because you've had to be stronger. That I know. Yes. Thank yes. you. You Thank just you. tap into that. Okay. We've got about two minutes All left, right. so I think I'm we can get... I'm just grateful you guys are here. Thank you. Thank, Thank we're glad you. glad you're here, too. Uh, two more questions? So. Okay. Hi. Um, Caroline Shattuck here. Um, I'm trying to start a luxury t-shirt business online. Um, I'm also, like, working with my family at the traditional office, so I'm kind of uh you know always last minute doing things and um it's hard to relate to i guess women or people my age like it's hard to find other people that are also kind of uh interest like entrepreneurial and um have the same like interests as i do like i'm here i mean i'm not alone but you know i'm trying to start my own thing so sort of alone in that sense um so do you have any advice for, um, I don't know, just uh, moving forward and, and uh, trying to be successful in, uh, you know, making money and not, uh, you know, cutting down your worth and the worth of what you're working on? Um, like I'm trying to charge like a higher price and everyone's trying to tell me like, you know, what to what to do but it's just it's hard like when you're like you said like after COVID and everything um you just get to being more independent and more uh you know n- narrowing your uh world until you, it's kind of like it's just hard to find other people that are I would, like-minded so not I'll just stop there but <laughs> any advice around those comments I would look online and see other people who are moving in the way that you want to be and try to make connections with them because I mean 
everybody, strangers love it if you like send them a message and say, hey, what you're doing is amazing, you know? And I think that it's very possible to find those you, sorts of connections Are you out based there. in Austin? Um, well, Dallas, but I come here a lot too. Well, you're in a fashion, you're like in the, in my opinion, Dallas is the Texas fashion Mecca. Oh, and if okay. you're not, I, I've I been don't there even, I don't even I like Dallas. So that there. means that I'm, I'm saying that from a real place. Um, I think you're in a really good city to be doing what it is you're doing. I think you should find a mentor. Yeah. There. I don't have, yeah. And if you're finding people that are telling you to change your prices, but they're not giving you reasons as to why mm -hmm. I would surround you. I like, I know it's hard to find people right. to surround yourself with but it's not impossible mm -hmm. and again you are in a fashion city yeah okay good mm -hmm. to know yeah. thank you well y'all i think we are at time so we uh, will take one more yeah he was yeah. waiting okay I, I it was just a quick question hi uh i'm a uh i'm john i'm a production student from ou ohio university uh i just wanted to get more clarification because i think you uh Arash, you brought up uh strengths being your 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 or weaknesses being your greatest strengths and i and i th think i've heard that before but i'm not exactly sure how to incorporate that like uh if you could give more insight on what you mean absolutely like i said the example for me personally was in my world in my industry it was primarily the fact that you have to be, I thought you had to be white male with an anglicized name to be successful. Why? Because everybody else around me was white male with an anglicized name that was successful. But we ran into issues within the organization. We ran into international issues. And the issue that we ran into was in Mexico because that's our second largest manufacturing facilities in Mexico. All of those gentlemen around me that I th was aspiring to be, they couldn't resolve the issue. I was able to resolve it. I resolved it because I'm very international. I spent probably 10 years of my life living in 19 different countries that gives you a different perspective on things. And issue couldn't be resolved. And I told the board of directors and I told the C-suite, I said, let me go down there. Let me go down to Mexico. I'll resolve this situation. And they all looked at me as if I had horns coming out of my ear. I went down to Mexico. I went down to the government office. I met with the individual. We did the, uh, the Mexican kiss on the cheeks. Why? Because I know Mexican culture is similar to European culture, which is similar to Iranian culture, and the kiss on the cheeks, people lower their uh, defense mechanisms. I resolved the problem that nobody else could. I realized that actually that perceived weakness, that I had to be a white male and I'm, I'm not, and I will never be able to be a white male, that actually was my greatest strength. So in general terms, you would say like, uh just upholding authenticity in whatever you do. 100%, absolutely. I agree with that. I'm team authenticity. Let's go. I yeah, think you're already yeah, ahead of the guys. game. <laughs> yep. yep, yep. Thank you so much, guys. I know it's four o'clock and it's hard to be here. You could be out drinking at a party, but you came here and hung with us and I appreciate it. Thank you so much to all of our panelists today. Thank and thanks you. to South by Southwest for having us. <laughs>